Well, hello, that's me again. Today is November 8th, 2023. It is Wednesday, and let me tell you, each morning I get up and I plan my day to start doing, you know, continue with my writing and things of that nature, and then suddenly something happened, and it's like, you know what, you cannot pass this by and you have to go out and kind of make a video on that explaining to people and I know many of you do expect me to comment I cannot comment it uh, you know every day but some things are very important which cannot be discarded or discounted and I'm not talking about the Gaza issue and Israel you all know my position on this issue so and as I already stated from military point of you this war does not interest me at all I mean it's just not the kind of war which is not really a war in many respects so but the point is uh, there are other things which are happening in the world and they are so important that they cannot be simply abandoned you know and not being commented on and the more I procrastinate the more I gather information the more I have to cramp it uh, after you know several days into the usually half an hour type uh, you know uh, video so let's not waste time and let's go in and this is not going to be about Gaza but it's going to be actually about no less important if not more in many respects events and we will start with this and I want to really uh, show you the uh, a, a quote from Alexander Svechin's uh, incredible uh, insightful treatise called strategy and here we have the first duty of the art of politics with respect to strategy is to formulate the political goal of a war. Any goal should be strictly coordinated with the resources available to achieve it. The political goal should be appropriate to one's war waging capabilities. To meet this requirement, a politician must have a correct conception of the relations of friendly to hostile forces, which requires extremely mature and profound judgment, a knowledge of the history, politics and statistics of both hostile states, and a certain amount of competence in basic military matters. The final statement of the goal would be made by the politician after an appropriate exchange of views with strategists, and it should help rather than hinder strategic decisions. Alexander Svechin, Strategy, 1927. As you might expect, pretty much all requirements which Svechin are uh, lists in this <coughs> wonderful quote is the fact that they do not apply they just do not apply because no western contemporary uh, political or even military leader satisfies those requirements they have no clue about war about the real economy about basically anything and i has been i have been uh, on this uh, issue for a long time now and to demonstrate to you why we are uh, basically observing the uh, implosion of the western civilization as it happens uh, as i speak here it is <coughs> here's mr robin brooks he uh, wrote it about yesterday and he says that and he uh, gives the prescription for Germany how the, what Germany needs and how German economy should be really like good and you know firing on all cylinders this is a typical American thinker if you wish or typical American what is not applied by Svechen's uh, um, quote first Germany needs cheap Russian gas Second, the way to get that is regime change in Russia. Three, only then can Nord Stream be turned on again. A financial crisis may lead to regime change. A lower G7 cap can produce such a crisis. This is uh, <clears throat> in Germany's best interest. So let's take a look who this guy from Brookings Institution. So um, here's his uh, curriculum vitae. Uh, he graduated there. Um, 
London School of Economics and <laughs> Political Science immediately. Red flag, immediately. The guy has no clue. And then, of course, he uh, graduated Yale University with a PhD in economics. As you can see yourself, the guy worked in every single, uh, uh, basically, globalist, neoliberal uh, BS corporation, starting from International Monetary Fund to Goldman Sachs, asset manager, and now chief economist on the Institute of International Finance. Look, he, look at his <clears throat> fundamental degree. It's called monetary economics. So this guy have no clue what he's dealing with and he has no clue how the real world operates. The only thing he knows is probably those uh, fictitious uh, GDP numbers. But if that hasn't been enough, well, uh, basically, Mr. Daniel Larison, I mean, one of the uh, more important, uh, th uh, used to be one of the more uh, important thinkers uh, on the former, uh, the American conservative, uh, before it turned out to be uh, turned into what it is today, he, being a PhD in history, wrote this wonderful thing about the uh, basically American political elite. Uh, he uh, uh, wrote it today and he writes in his blog that uh, there is new third um, GOP candidates uh, 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 discussion debate is coming and as he says there is nothing less appealing than the prospect of watching a stage full of militarists denounce each other for being insufficient, insufficiently belligerent I will probably end up scanning a transcript of their remark la later to see how deranged their rhetoric has become but that's it you know what couldn't have said it better myself but because, uh, here's mr uh, uh larison and again as i said he he is now uh writes periodically for andrew basevich uh, uh soros funded the whatever the responsible statecraft magazine but the point is that he makes uh, a, a great case about this because what you have take any including the guys with the military service uh for example, like Tom Cotton, you know, or whatever, who from the U.S. Congress, practically anybody, and um, take any candidates uh, from the GOP or from Democrats, you wouldn't find the person who has a minimum satisfaction of the criteria which are required for the serious political leader. And yesterday, I was stunned by the fact that, well, uh, Glenn Greenwald, when uh, Greenwald, when he's talking to Carlson, Tucker Carlson, um, on his uh, uh, Tucker on X, and thankfully somebody put it up on the YouTube, he stated in unequivocal terms that part of the reason for the military catastrophe which is happening in Ukraine, not for Ukraine, Ukraine is done, it's over, but for the combined West is the fact that, and you actually there are, uh, it's in 5.14, uh, uh, the five minutes from the start of it, when he talks about that it is the, they wanted to exact vengeance for allegedly Russian interference with, in the election cycle <laughs> when Hillary lost, and they just hate Russians, just plain and simple. But there is, a, again, kernel of the common sense in what he says, because yes, they hate Russia so much that they would believe any kind of garbage, like this idiot from the uh, Brookings Institution or whatever international economic, whatever the shyster organization he represents, that they hate it so much that no knowledge is required, no professional qualifications, no abilities are required. So fact is, if you want to really get uh, waste your life, Life, go and join and try to get into the London School of Economics. It's basically the degree meal producing imbeciles. And as pretty much most of the elite, so to speak, uh, humanities or economy, uh, uh, um, um, economy based education in the, uh, in the Western world. So, and when Glenn, Glenn Grunwald says about it, and he talks about it, I mean, he extensively, you can go and look up your, you know, look at this video, and I watch this video, I really suggest you to do so. We have the other thing, and um, if anybody wanted to know what is happening in um, Ukraine right now, well, here it is. 
and uh, it's from New York Times. Now, armed forces of Ukraine uh, basically dead uh, uh, six troops. Women prepare for the call. They now removed all limitations on women ages 40 through 60. There you go, serving as the full-blown frontline soldier, be them, you know, grenade launcher handlers or drivers of APCs, what have you, in the combat role, usually uh, basically des uh, designed for men doing this. There you go. This is what you need to know about the situation militarily for armed forces of Ukraine. But again, uh, uh, U.S. Uh, media or Western media, if you wish, wouldn't be Western media if they still won't try to, fa uh, you know, save their face. And here we have this situation with the uh, New York Times again. And look at this. They suddenly says that. Biden confronts the limits of U.S. leverage in two conflicts. The one of the leverage of the two conflicts, of course, is Gaza, but and nothing they can do about this uh, with Netanyahu because U.S. Congress supporting the, the genocide of Palestinians and they love their hands to be well soaked in blood. And Biden can do very little, despite the fact that Blinken tries to arrange some kind of ceasefire. The second, of course, conflict is uh, armed forces of Ukraine. This is special military operations and how Russians. Uh, uh, prosecuted and uh, as you can see yourself uh, in Ukraine the uh, peace continues the country's most senior military commander Valery Zaluzhny uttered the world uh, the word last week that US officials carefully avoided for the better part of a year stalemate I have news for well Zaluzhny we know who Zaluzhny is he's a shyster and I uh, he he sucks as a general he is not very bright fellow but hey whatever MI6 now wants this guy instead of Zelensky who obviously is constantly high and produces some statements which testify to the serious psychiatric disorder in him and people who handle him but of course MI6 wants Zaluzhny well again it's MI6 no new MI6 six and new people in London who are as clueless as basically this guy uh, from the Brookings institution I showed you in the beginning of this video so what is the stalemate? Well, no, stalemate is the cover word, is the euphemism, because obviously the only thing they can say is that it is stalemate, which implies that both sides are the, are the impasse, impasse of the uh, military operation. But the problem is, of course, it's absolutely not true, because Russia has a complete escalation dominance on the uh, strategic and operational level, well, and tactical too, basically, when you look at the number of the losses or uh, the armed forces of Ukraine or whatever left of them and Russians are actually on the uh, offensive and the point is not that Russians want this big you know uh, uh, arrow offensives and take as many you know uh, territory much territory or um, settlements villages and cities as they can no not at all russians are now in the state of the guy who just as i already spoke today to anya earlier they are thrust the knife into the body of the victim which is of course not just ukraine but the nato but they do not do this final push of those two millimeters uh, between the blade of the the tip of the knife and uh, the heart of the victim no they rotate the blade in this wound and they will continue to do this and here we have this continuation of this uh new york times uh uh piece which is really hilarious and uh, when you look at this well you begin to read this and you have to really take it in Zaluzhny said that it would take a major technological advance in weaponry to end the stalemate on the ground and added that there will most likely be no deep and beautiful breakthrough but it is unclear what technology leap would look like okay I can tell you Nothing short of the nuclear weapons, nothing, absolutely nothing, and whatever quantities what United States can uh, deliver to Ukraine will change the outcome. It's simply impossible. And of course, the this uh, the th thing about Atacams is a joke. Again, how many times should I explain that Atacams is the uh, basically standard 
standard read my lips, standard type of the target for most of Russia's air defense complexes, starting from the Panzer through to our M1 or M2, and obviously from Book and on and on and on and on. Then now here while Biden begins to not not Biden we know it's not Biden handlers Obama uh, Susan Rice whatever those you know basically mafia which is behind him his handlers so now Biden is trying to channel fatigue and frustration with the war in Ukraine born of the growing sense that billions of dollars in American arms aid and intelligence collections has simply failed to overcome the assembled weight of the dug in Russian army and then we have the guy and the guy's name is Douglas Lute, or however you read it. What I worry about Douglas Lute, a retired general who was central to putting together of the Afghanistan strategy in the Bush and Obama administrations, immediately, red flag, remove the guy. He doesn't know anything about the war. He will not be able to run anything above brigade level. So there you go. But hey, here's the guy. Set an, a, a, an event at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point last week is that we are giving them enough to stay in the fight, but not enough to win. And here comes the question. I would love to talk to Douglas Lute or any kind of the American general about what it means to provide enough to win. Do they even know what victory means? I begin to doubt it because before that, as I already stated, I was giving my, uh, you know, uh, credit where the credit was due and respecting and, you know, uh, using appropriate decorum when talking about U.S. Army. But now I begin to think that they are that incompetent. The only thing that they can do is PR. The guy who was central for developing strategy in Afghanistan, I spoke to people who have been in Afghanistan at that time when United States forces have been there. They laughed at them. They didn't even know that they literally had several uh, Taliban outposts hidden in the in practically plain sight around those bases within the uh, not just uh, Afghanistan villages or somewhere else, but they were within the uh, actually Kabul proper. And when you look at this guy, strategy of what? What do you mean? Strategy to fighting the, uh, what, uh, those guys in the sandals and having RPG-7s and AK-74s? You already had this Mr. Petraeus, who evidently has no clue what is the modern warfare, as evidently most of those guys who go out and begin to explain a way why it's not the stalemate. There is no stalemate, my friends. There is a systematic annihilation of the remnants of the Ukrainian armed forces happening right now and there is no real force. It is a, well, I have to use the term Mr. McGregor uses, broken force. It doesn't work anymore. It basically refuses to fight. There's a huge morale issues. They surrender now in huge numbers. But you will not see that being reported, obviously, because, well, as I already stated many times, and this is well documented. Ukrainian soldiers, Ukrainian officers say that this NATO training is garbage. It's useless in the modern war. And they go back to good old Soviet field manuals or download whatever they can first. Unclassified, for example, field manuals of Russian armed forces, be that 2005 or the latest 2000, I believe 16 or 17 on the level of the, you know, platoon, you know, tank and things of this nature. Anything which goes above it in the com uh, company level, let alone battalion and everything else is classified. But I think so some of them know how to get to this information and they begin to fight good old, you know, Soviet Russian field manuals because NATO field manuals are useless. They were created by people who do not understand what a real war is, what actual long-range fires are, and when you look at this, my gosh, and you think so that this is just ends on that? No, this is just the beginning of it, and then suddenly we have this situation. I, before I go and talk about it, let me give you the review of what I wrote almost to the day on the 15th November 2021 about the, uh, the only program in the United States of the so-called hypersonic weapons, which prom had some promise. Uh, all other programs are pretty much closed right now because they were utter failures. Well, guess what? This is me two years ago. 
that's what I write. Dark, e Dark Eagle does not exist as a weapon system yet. Some prototype was tested a couple of times and I don't doubt very much that activity which happens right now in Germany such as deployment, remember? They were deploying it, you know, of ground infrastructure for this future missile is nothing more than PR. In fact, I'm almost 100% positive that it is a, a PR in a desperate attempt to address concerns about actual hypersonic gap between the US and Russia and China, so the grandiose statement for about this deployment and then of course um I'm talking about what they were talking about, uh, I mean, what they were uh, uh, presenting this missile. Obviously, for Mach 17 missile, which is roughly 5.8 kilometers per second, even if to consider a short slower boost phase, it should cover the range of exactly 2,000 kilometers between Mainz Castle launch site in Germany and Moscow in about uh, 5.7 minutes. But now they, after that, you know, after those grandiose statements, including about, by the way, made by at that time, Mr. Trump himself about this super duper missile. Well, they recalculated the time to reach Moscow was increased to 21 minutes 30 seconds. Why? Well, Russians know what the US is working on this program. You can find it in Russian media space if you want to. And some military people point out that the United States is basically trying to recreate a longer version of Iskander and place some version of common hypersonic light body on top of it, and it is not a Mach 17 weapon. Probably Mach 5 at least 7 weapon. And what it will not be, I already stated, it will not be a real hypersonic cruise missile capable to strike moving targets on land and on the surface of the sea. In other words, it will be neither 3M22 Zircon nor Kinjal, which are bona fide cruise missiles, Kinjal being a ballistic one. And here, what I'm talking also in addition, if we're talking about defense from such a missile, which is not even in the initial operational capability, and is primarily a PR action designed to forestall streaming in constantly uh, news about uh, streaming in constantly news about successful tests of Russian and Chinese hypersonic weapons and technologies, so much so that Warmonger and Yakon in chief in the US Senate, Lindsey Graham, demanded a classified briefing about the situation with Russians and all that. But then, of course, I'm talking about that Russian air defense and anti-missile systems long ago covered the performance envelope of possible future US hypersonic weapons. In the end, I wrote today in uh, two, two years ago, about S-500 already in serial production and deployment, and S-550, which will be available in 2025. But here is the what I'm concluding this. Two years ago, again, but here we also hit this impenetrable cognitive, cognitive wall, a deliberate semantic goalpost moving device invented in the West to cover its very own loss of the arms race, which confuses people completely, and they fail to grasp this tremendous difference between real hypersonic atmosphere riding, fully controllable and guided high precision weaponry such as 3M22 Zircon Okenjal, designed to attack and then annihilate, analyze annihilate any type of targets, moving and stationary, ground and sea, and all those primarily fixed ground targets attack, uh, attackers such as this dark eagle thing. But nobody calls International Space Station a hypersonic space station. And that's the problem. They talk about probably burn out of the booster uh, stage, which who knows what it is, Mach 5, 6 probably. And here is the point. The United States is nowhere near in fielding high supersonic, forget about genuine hypersonic, anti-shipping and land attack missile. The US tried once to develop indigenous supersonic anti-shipping missile. The missile prototype came out so under, uh, underwhelming in performance and so expensive that all attempts have been abandoned. And guess what? We're looking today at this news. Oh my gosh. Uh, November 7th, actually yesterday, sorry. Army anticipates another delay in fielding Dark Eagle hypersonic weapon after detecting problem. 
A recent sandbag means it's unlikely that the Yun army will achieve its goal for fielding its first set of Dark Eagle hypersonic missiles by the end of the calendar year, according to the service top weapons buyer. They talk about that their test at the uh, station, uh, Space Force Station in Florida didn't go forward as planned. Hmm, what could have happened, I guess? Well, here is more elaboration on their on. Um, uh, this uh, failure. They said that army officials had said they wanted to conduct another flight test before moving forward with fielding the system. However, Lovett, the guy, the uh, spokesperson, uh, who basically was describing the situation with the Dark Eagle, uh, declined to provide more information about why the test schedule for last week did not happen, and whether it was cancelled or a result of a major technical failure. In response to further inquiries, the spokesperson also did not provide an updated timeline for when the Army is now anticipating it will field the weapon or comment on any potentially associated delays. Delivering hypersonic weapons remains a top priority for DOD, Lovett told a Defense Scoop. Well, as I already stated, United States lost the hypersonic race. They are working on this, make no mistake, they are trying to do it. They want to create those gliders, at least on the what would be intermediate range uh, hypersonic weapon. But you have to understand the complexity of the problems they are facing because United States never went into the real serious supersonic flight on its missiles. It never collected the data on this. because. They never had it, they never operated, while Russia was operating supersonic missiles, inc including, the, of course, the uh, anti-shipping missiles, still operates, like, I mean, since 1960s. And when you look at this, yeah, you need to have the data set. You need to have the same as you when you deal with the operational and strategic level. You need to have those war correlates. You need to have this data to see for yourself what trends are discovered there, what is happening, statistically speaking. And this is not just the engineering, engineering problem. How they want to do this gliding body when actually every single test they did, look, look it up, it's all over the internet. Every single test of those glide, gliders have been unsuccessful. It was a disaster. Russia fields now avant-garde is the first line. It's not even IOC. It's a front line, uh, basically weapon system, strategic weapon system. Now we're looking at the serially produced Kinjals, which already have an amazing combat record. They proved themselves in the real combat, in the real serious combat. You have Zircon being now placed on the ships of Russian surface fleet. And now, the next year, we have Zircon being, uh, basically uh, uh, coming on the nuclear-powered submarines with its uh, Mach 9, uh, 1500 kilometer range. What are we talking about? And so, when you look at this at the news, and when you look at the situation, obviously, with the, <clears throat> uh, basically, abandoning this treaty, NATO already con condemns Russia, you know, that Russians withdrew from the Conventional for uh, Forces Treaty. Well, it wasn't Russia who withdrew itself from C Conventional Forces Treaty, uh, um, because uh, it was NATO which actually, United States primarily lied to Russia about expansion of NATO, so Russians don't care anymore. Yes, Russians don't care generally with the about the relations with the West. And in a statement the same day, NATO condemned Moscow's decision, branding it the latest in a series of actions that systematically undermine Euro-Atlantic security. <laughs> there is no Euro-Atlantic security. Russians are not going to basically attack <clears throat> Europe, unless, of course, Europeans decide to commit suicide. There is no security. Europe is done. United States gonna eat it alive and Europe will, it's becoming already poor and that will be the end of the European security, the same as the, of the European socialism, which they thought that, you know, they had because they had what? As this uh, Robin Brooks uh, imbecile stated that Russian, they need Russian energy. Nah, nah, they're not gonna get Russian energy anymore. <clears throat> and as Mr. Lavrov stated today, 
for them people people who do not understand what is happening russia doesn't need relief not because we choose isolationism or self-sufficiency when he was talking about the sanctions but because the west decided to destroy the world economy for the sake of teaching russia a lesson and you know so and <coughs> he lavrov specifically mentioned the terrorist attacks against the north stream undersea gas pipelines in september 20,000, uh, 2022 saying that <coughs> put an end to the hopes of europe that someday cheap gas will be back and stimulate their economy once again no it's not going to stimulate the economy once again because the United States also wants to eat. And of course, as we return to both Mr. Brooks and of course Mr. Svechen's uh, wonderful uh, <clears throat> quote, no modern Western politician or military leader even remotely satisfied the requirements, which for example, Mr. Putin and his uh, basically uh, circle of friends and professionals who serve in Russian government satisfy completely being the strategist of the top-notch level and having understanding of the real economy, real military and what have you. And that is also one of the parts which I have to go and uh, get to Glenn, Glenn Greenwald. One of the reasons they also hate Russians because if you look at American, let alone European elites, they're pathetic. They are incompetent hacks who are also have no morality, no understanding of right and wrong, and they know they are hacks. They feel it. And they look at Putin, they look at Russia, and they just suffocate from envy and jealousy. That is why they hate Russia. And of course, they lie about it. But then again, lying and basically the only skill any American politician has, none of them have any useful skills. They only skill have is how to reelect themselves. That means what? Producing lies nonstop, lying to the uh, electorate and people who will vote for them. That's the only capability they have. And other than that, none of them would qualify for any serious statement. There are none, none, zero, zilch. I cannot see anybody on the horizon, including, of course, Mr. Trump. But that's my opinion about this. And this is what I wanted to tell you today. So, as always, those who like what I do, please subscribe to, to my channel. It is free, obviously. And those who can afford, please support me on Patreon and buy me a coffee too. And that will allow to continue for me to do what I'm doing. And I want to express my profound gratitude to my wonderful patrons who do keep me in this business. I cannot even express enough, for, you know, uh, gratitude for you guys. So, and this is what I was about to tell you today and um, have a nice rest of your week and I'll talk to you later guys. Bye bye.